Hi, this is a, a quick 10 minute video version of the longer stress injury talk also on my channel. It's important to distinguish a stress or fatigue fracture from an insufficiency fracture. Stress fractures occur in folks with normal bone but subject to excessive re repetitive forces, whereas insufficiency fractures are people with osteoporosis or osteopenia that may be subject to more normal forces. It's important to distinguish a stress reaction from a stress fracture. Stress reaction is where you have periosteal or endosteal edema, but no visible fracture. We only call something a stress fracture if there's actually a fracture line visible. MRI will show marrow edema. You may see edema along the periosteal or endosteal surface. And the fracture lines, if present, typically are a linear low signal within the area of marrow edema. These fractures are almost always incomplete, and it's uncommon to have more than one site of stress injury at a time. We'll work our way down through the body here, starting at the pelvis. Sacral stress fracture, 22-year-old male, right sacral ala, marrow edema, low signal fracture line, periosteal reaction. Oblique coronals, the T1s show the edema as low signal with a low signal fracture line, the T2s are somewhat more conspicuous because of the fat suppression and contrast, marrow edema, fracture line centered up in the edema. Fat suppression is critical. Here's one where the fat suppression failed or wasn't turned on. See a low signal line, but you see it much better with fat suppression turned on, suppressing the normal marrow fat. Classic stress fracture in the proximal femur on the medial side. A lot of low signal on T1 weighted imaging, bright ill-defined edema on T2, partial fracture line. This is a high risk fracture. If this isn't recognized and treated appropriately with like non-weight bearing or crutches, this could complete and require surgery. Femoral diaphyseal stress fractures also occur. Proximal femoral shaft, marrow edema, in the, in the marrow cavity on the T2 periosteal reaction. These thick cortical bones like the femur and the tibia are less prone to fracture, but you have to be careful to look for a little intracortical signal like this that could be a partial longitudinal fracture line. Here's the periosteal edema, endosteal and marrow edema. Patient with a positive bone scan along the right distal thigh thought it could be something aggressive, such as a tumor. MRI also potentially aggressive with marrow edema along the T2-weighted scan here, some low signal on T1. Contrast was given, shows enhancement along the periosteal surface, some marrow edema uh, and enhancement as well. The important thing to realize is this is actually a longitudinal stress fracture. If you look at the axial CT, you can see a vessel going through the cortex here, but further down, what you can see is that there's a perpendicular line to the cortex that's actually a longitudinal fracture over a fairly long extent of the femoral cortex, kind of inferiorly and laterally. Longitudinal stress fracture can easily mimic a more aggressive process. Around the knee, we used to call this spontaneous osteonecrosis, where you have a low signal on T1 and somewhat on PD images, depending on the pulse sequence, bright signal on T2, and you can see subchondral fluid here, the cartilage being more or less intact, but that's some subchondral collapse that if biopsy could actually show osteonecrosis. What we realize now is that this is actually typically starts out as a subchondral insufficiency fracture. Here's a different patient, has a degenerated and torn meniscus on T2, extensive marrow edema, kind of serpentine subchondral lines. These are the little fracture lines. And if this patient isn't treated with non-weight bearing and careful follow-up, that could progress to one of those appearances that looks like uh, subchondral uh, osteonecrosis. Patient thought to possibly have peasant serene bursitis. T1-weighted scan. Here we see the partial fracture line better on T1 than on T2, but a lot of marrow edema. That's not going to be from just a bursitis. That's an osseous stress fracture. It can be hard to tell on radiographs whether something is acute or chronic. Patient training for a marathon, periosteal reaction here, fairly mature, 
It's abnormal in that location in the tibia, so it could be a stress injury, kind of age indeterminate, could be chronic, could be more acute. In this case, MRI a couple days later shows all the marrow edema, partial fracture line through the posterior cortex and marrow space of the tibia in the exact same location. So MRI can really help to grade injuries and determine acuity. Commonly, we see these type of stress reactions in the tibia, different patient, pretty normal T1, maybe a little bit of low signal, marrow edema on the T2 weighted scan, the axial sections nicely show periosteal edema along the tibial surface, some marrow edema here, good appearance for a moderate grade, mild to moderate grade stress reaction, no intracortical signal, no discrete fracture. This is a stress reaction, not a fracture. An important tibial abnormality is a so-called dreaded black line, and this is a transversely oriented fracture, in this patient having four of them, where it doesn't tend to heal well. So these lead to fibrosis and granulation tissue in the region of the fracture, and they set up the patient for a potential complete fracture because of weakening of the bone. Here's one example of that in a soccer player recently. He had a cortical stress fracture there that wasn't recognized, went on to continue playing, and you can see he nearly completely fractured through the tibia. Um, some of these uh, patients have been treated with intramedullary nail placement or with drilling out the area of stress fracture, putting in bone graft, in some cases PRP injection, which may or may not help. In the foot, it's not uncommon in military recruits to have stress injuries. Here in the sagittal T1 calcaneus, low signal line across the region of the apophysis here. T2, extensive marrow edema throughout the calcaneus, low signal fracture line. Tarsal navicular, another high risk area for stress injury. Typically, they occur, occur in this type of a, a sagittal orientation along the dorsal surface of the navicular proximally. Here's the marrow edema on T2. Here's the partial fracture line. If we look perpendicular to that, here's the navicular. This is going to be calcaneus here. Extensive edema throughout the navicular. Low signal fracture line dorsally in a sagittal orientation. CT we use sometimes to look for the fractures, but it's not very sensitive. It's more often used to look for healing patterns. Note that the CT done in the same day in that patient just shows a very subtle area of sclerosis, and you could easily call this normal, missing that stress fracture if CT was the only thing you did. Metatarsal stress fractures are quite common, uh, nicely laid out here in the fourth metatarsal, mid-shaft, extensive edema. If you didn't notice this low signal line there and some callus forming, you might uh, confuse this for an infiltrative process like a tumor like a Ewing sarcoma or lymphoma or um, osteomyelitis possibly. So it's important to recognize that this low signal kind of smudgy line here is indeed the fracture line. Radiographs are obviously important in this setting. In that patient, radiographs just a few days before the MRI were still normal, but following him over time, you could see callus forming about that fracture and eventually healing at about six weeks. In the fifth metatarsal, Stress fractures proximally are relatively common. Again, they tend to be incomplete, but if they go on to complete, it can be a problem for the patient. So these um, get followed carefully, and in some patients get treated with an intramedullary screw placed into the fifth metatarsal. The tarsal uh, sesamoids at the first MTP uh, also can be subject to stress response, AVN, injury, fracture, or stress reaction and stress fracture. This one we think is a stress fracture because the sesamoid looks like it's really one piece of bone to start out with, but then has a fairly discrete low signal line across it where the two pieces fit together. So this is a good example of a, of a stress fracture of the first metatarsal sesamoid. That can be a big problem for patients if it's not recognized and treated appropriately. Here's a different patient but had somewhat of a sclerotic, perhaps sesamoid, some calcifications next to it, but it's basically in one piece and as time went on, went on to fragment, become more irregular, and that may be AVN. I'm not saying that all stress injuries will go on to AVN, but the appearance can overlap and it can be hard to tell. So in conclusion, stress injuries are really quite common depending on your population of patients. You want to look for periosteal reaction, marrow edema, 
fractures are almost always incomplete. The fracture line needs to be within the area of edema. And if you want to get more details on this and see quite a few more examples and some more obscure things and mimics, please check out the full-length video on my YouTube channel. Thank you, and I'm always happy to have your feedback.